All right, so here we are today for Build a Better Book, connecting the BBI community and remote learning. And we have Neil McKenzie and Eli Sanchez with us. Neil is an assistive technology instructor with the Sonoma County Office of Education. And Eli is also an assistive technology specialist with the Sonoma County Office of Education and many, many other organizations. <laughs> so <laughs> they, will be, <laughs> they will be sharing um, a lot of their expertise and experiences, especially in this time of remote learning, um, when we all are um, doing more online and how they've um, really connected with their uh, students, um, both in formal and informal learning situations. So welcome, Neil and Eli. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let me... Neil McKenzie has started screen share. Oh. Yeah, can you guys all see that? Is that showing up? Yep. All right, so my name is Neil McKenzie, and she's correct. I'm AT specialist. Um, I work for SCO, which is the Sonoma County Office of Education. And actually, my position is pretty unique. I don't think I've met anyone else who's an AT specialist that um, works for a specific department. So I work for the visual support department. So I work specifically with um, our students K through 12 who are blind and visually impaired. Um, we service over 40 districts. So we're all over the place, not right now, but typically we are. Um, and we uh, support students, um, some of them all year round. So I'm still going with some students. Um, we have students in different schedules and we are ramping up to see what next year will look like. Um, and Eli, do you want to tell them a little bit about you? Yeah, uh, so as mentioned, my name is Eli Sanchez. Uh, I also live here in uh, Northern California, Sonoma County. Um, unlike Neil, my job is, I mean, my position is anything but specific. <laughs> um, I work with everything from transitional students, so coming out of the high school system, coming into college, um, so typically 16 years and older. Um, and I also, so I, I work, you know, I, I train them to uh, get their jobs or any, any type of assistive software up, uh, their skills up to date and, and kind of running on that. Um, so I work with the Department of Rehab here in California uh, and also contract out I just, I just, I just contract out everywhere. Um, <laughs> yeah, we, we um, typically when my, my, my typical work would be traveling out to school districts and working with entire school districts uh, or companies providing the, uh, uh, assistive technology consulting if they were to have um, any, any, uh, any employee that would require anything like Zoom text or Supernova or anything like that. Um, so I, I would typically travel to the site. I used to do about six, probably six to 700 miles a week going around the Bay Area here. Um, just traveling around and, uh, and, uh, and kind of doing some consulting. I also produce uh, Braille for the area here. I produce Braille for, oh boy. Um, I'm not even sure how many counties in this area. I just, I just produce Braille for uh, those that need it. Um, anything from uh, tactile graphics, me and Neil put those together all the way to, um, you know, um, certain worksheets or parts of books or uh, eulogies, anything like that. So that's, uh, I, I work with the, uh, I work with the Earl Baum Center for the Blind here in, in Santa Rosa, California. They're a nonprofit and, uh, and my other Official company would be uh, Adaptive Technology Services. I contract out to them in San Francisco. Um, yeah. Awesome. So Eli works everywhere and yeah. he is in high demand around here. Um, and mostly where we cross over um, is we started, I don't even know how many years ago. Oh. Um, it's through the Earl Bomb Center, but we started. Um, our Earl Baum Hangout, which the original goal was to get, um, we had students that uh, literally went almost all the way through high school and never had met another person who was blind or had a visual impairment. Um, so we wanted to find a way that was more social to get them together so they can just really talk freely 
um, about what was their experience. Um, and so we developed the Earl Bomb Hangout, which we meet once a month. Um, lately, it's been more um, because of um, isolation issues and trying to get more social activities. Um, so we started out actually trying to be a little bit more um, outlined in our hangouts, but soon realized that these students just wanted to play games. Um, so we really focused on making accessible games, building a library, and um, that seemed by far to be the most successful and what the kids wanted to do. When it came down to it, uh, the kids just wanted to eat popcorn, play games, and talk about what's going on with them. So um, it's become really successful for our students, and, and this group has become extremely close. Um, and the game part was huge and I know that is you know runs right along with build a better book um, because the lack of accessible games um, and materials is a constant so we had students that would come in and we would say okay what game would you like to adapt and um, a lot of them said that that would be the first time that they were able to play that with their family um, and be completely accessible because um, the goal was to have them not need any sighted help um, and they can fully participate. So that has been going on for, I think we've been doing this for four years, four, five, maybe. About five years. I was um, five, yeah, I five uh, out of high school. Yeah, five years. Um, so we're gonna get back to that because I think there's a lot of great opportunities that we've learned through this whole thing. Um, the shelter in place that really aligns perfectly with um, adapted materials and especially adapted games. And I know a lot of the Builder Better Book partners are focused on that. Um, so March 18th, that's when the shelter in place for Sonoma County happened. And all of a sudden, I mean, our department was just had no idea what we were going to do because it was already happening. The transition to remote teaching was there um, and there was not a lot of prep time for us. Um, <clears throat> And we were especially nervous because we had that extra layer of consideration for our students and our clients, um, our, our kiddos who are blind and visually impaired. So not only were we jumping into this whole new online environment, but it was too soon for classrooms to really test out the theory of, is everything accessible? Um, and there was no turning back. It was like, we're giving keys to a car and we weren't sure how it was gonna run, but here you go, start driving. Um, so some of the factors that worried us for our students is what were the home setups like? Um, would this be an environment that they could access and um, that they would be successful in it? Um, and all of a sudden there's these new programs that were used to model these online classrooms. Um, and when you introduce these, um, especially to someone who's um, blind or visually impaired, there's a whole other learning curve than just, you know, maybe the 10 or 15 minutes it would take someone sighted um, to learn visually um, a new program. Um, and Eli, did you want to talk about maybe the learning curve for someone who's using a screen reader? Yeah. Um, so I should probably add in, I've left this part off of my first introduction here. Uh, I myself am completely blind. I have no light perception. Um, so the primary way of me running all my devices, and that is currently two computers and four iPhones, and I got a Braille, uh, Braille note taker laying around here somewhere, um, is mainly through the use of a screen reader. Um, so whether it be something like a voiceover on the Mac, uh, so Apple computer platform, uh, or JAWS or Narrator or NVDA, either one of those three on the Windows platform, uh, Windows 10, um, or VoiceOver, or TalkBack, you know, VoiceOver being on the Apple products, so uh, iPhone, uh, iPad, Apple Watch, uh, Apple TV, those things, um, and then TalkBack would be found on the Android platform, so, you know, anything running, uh, uh, I can't remember which was the first one to really have it, but yeah, all the new ones, all the new Androids have some form of TalkBack on them. Um, and just as Neil mentioned, um, when when March 18th came around, um, I was still I was meeting with clients until March 17th, and then, you know, when we got the full mandate, it was everything just was a dead stop. 
um, and I had I had uh, I had students uh, that were coming out of the high school, getting ready to transition into their uh, college environment, um, and this was around the time this was right around the time for spring break for a lot of these uh, a lot of these institutions. Um, so some people, you know, I some people did have the benefit of having a week long delay between the shelter in place and the startup of the next uh, uh, school session. Um, and that week long delay uh, was pretty important because it gave, uh, you know, it gave me time to kind of assess like what's going to be, well, me and I both kind of, we just, we just got together and well, you know, what, what's going to be the immediate, um, what's going to be the platform that's going to be used in the school system. And so I made sure um, we would go through the basics, just, you know, the basics of a little bit of each platform, um, because as Neil mentioned, it is a way different to navigate programs with a screen reader than it is by just visually looking at a screen. Um, because if you're not on a certain uh, button, so if your cursor doesn't land on a certain area of the screen, the screen reader will not read it out. So, you know, not being able to screen, it's like, you might as well just say that the button doesn't exist, that the screen reader can't find it. Um, and when you do use a screen reader, um, you're not using the mouse at all. So in many instances, uh, directions like, uh, you know, click on the button in the bottom right hand corner, that doesn't apply to people that use a screen reader because you're using a, you're running your computer solely with a, with a keyboard. And due to that, it's, it's, uh, it's like you're running a computer in a linear fashion. So you're going from the top of the screen to the bottom of the screen and yeah. uh, the entire screen, it's one big line. It's not, it's not like a grid pattern or any shape like that, that we are visually, we're visually seen on the screen. So um, you would have to learn that you'd have to learn that navigation for each new program. Yeah. And that's after you try to figure out, even if it is accessible, meaning are things labeled, is it set out in a way that's easily, easily navigate, you know, you can easily navigate it. Um, and there were so many different programs being thrown at us during that time. Yeah. And also the movement to digital content. Um, oh. I know, you know, we all, we all have had to make that movement to almost everything being digital. Um, but then that still that question is, is it accessible? Mm -hmm. So if it's not something could, it's be the difference between someone who's blind or visually impaired to have complete access to be able to um, really get in there and to manipulate things or to not be able to even have anything read to them. It could just come up as an image. Um, so that was our second concern. And then third, I know, and it was the same for Eli's, how are we going to get Braille and tactile and spatial information out to students who really needed it? Because the school didn't stop. So it's not like these math assignments stopped. It's not like these science, you know, assignments stopped and they still needed um, that tactile and spatial um, layout in order to access it. So that led to a loss for me, which was the loss of my garage um, pretty quickly. So I had to turn my garage into a tactile protection facility pretty quick. Um, so we have um, a picture of myself in a corner crammed in a garage with a pee off machine. And I think, I don't know if we can, after we'll definitely leave time for questions um, and explain if um, people don't know what the pee off machine is. Um, an ink, inkjet printer, an embosser, and my 3D printer. So um, I would um, make these materials and then twice, in the beginning I was doing twice a week drop off. So I think Thursday, uh, Tuesday and Friday um, would deliver materials to students. Um, and my neighbors were pretty confused as to what was happening and the sounds that were coming out of my garage. Because um, that the embosser and the 3D printer make pretty unique and strange sounds. Um, so that was one of the main things I know Eli still had to get um, Braille out to his clients too. So we really were thinking about right away not losing that chain um, because there was already so many adjustments made and 
to lose some of those assignments that just needed to be in Braille, that just needed to be tactile, would have been um, really bad. Um, so we talked a lot about what would be the main need, um, like right away, especially I think that second week. Um, and we realized that everyone was going to Zoom. So that was what we thought would be the first um, immediate need. And so here I have a um, quote from Socrates that says, the secret of change is to focus all of your energy, not on fighting the old, but on building the new. So we realized that Zoom was the immediate need um, because that seemed like a consensus, and especially that first week or even during you know, the rest of the time that that was the platform that was gonna be um, used. So <clears throat> Eli, you wanna talk about a little bit about what we had to do that, that first week. Yeah, um, so during that first week, uh, it was, like Neil said, it's pretty apparent that the Zoom platform was gonna be like the platform for everything. Um, so we, gosh, Neil, how many meetings did we set up in that first week, man? <laughs> it, it was so many, I was so Zoomed out that. Yeah, it was, that was a, yeah. yeah, it was a lot. We would, we set up so many practice meetings and uh, I mean, we trialed everything from running zoom off of um off of uh, brown note takers so the brown note takers today are off of the android platform uh, we trialed the running zoom from uh the I ios platform from uh, mac platform uh, windows platform and not just the biggest thing for us was it wasn't just getting the students um to join zoom and be able to listen to it and, and see what's going on on the screen and what have you. It was more about getting them to be full participants in the Zoom meeting. So um, making sure that we knew how to guide people um, to raise their hand um, or to uh, participate in the chat um, or to select uh, certain users from the chat and send them direct messages or send them out to the whole group. Um, you know, how to upload files when needed, how to download files when needed, how to allow, um, how to allow access to get the device controlled uh, through Zoom. Uh, you know, it, it just to be full and full, full participants of the Zoom world, I guess you can say, um, not yeah. just, not just kind of stand by and, and, uh, and kind of observe what's going on around them. Um, and I don't know, we would we would just set up so many practice meetings and, and me and Neil and you know usually another third person um, would would just practice make sure we had all this stuff down and, and man, we spent hours on this just making sure we had everything perfected on this. Yeah, and like Eli said, that was a huge part of this. Um, so right away I made um, what you're seeing on the screen is a is a PDF of um, something that would be run through a PIAF machine. So it's the spatial layout for Zoom, um, but once it's ran through that PF machine, um, it becomes tactile. And so there's Braille and print on it. So I sent those out to my students right away um, via free matter. Um, and then when we did these lessons, they would have a reference of the navigation and what was available to them um, on the screen. Um, because like Eli mentioned, that was huge for us, not to, not to just be able to click on the link and join a Zoom meeting, but to feel comfortable and be active participants uh, uh, rather than passive. Um, so right away we sent these out and, and started meetings and, it, and the scheduling of those meetings was kind of crazy. And some of them, just because we didn't have enough time, um, some of, um, especially in our group, um, the Earl Bomb Hangout, some of them would be in having college class maybe in half an hour after we did our training on Zoom. Um, for them to feel comfortable with it. Um, so that was something that was a kind of the main focus um, in the beginning. But through this, it got us thinking about, okay, we have these new parameters, um, especially for, for teaching. And I think um, all of, a lot of you have, have felt that. Um, how do we accomplish you know, some of the same things um, with these new parameters that we're in? We're in this new world. Um, and so, we were thinking about that um, as it pertained to our Earl Bomb Hangout. How do we get these kids involved and 
socialization, something that's fun, something that they experience when we can all meet together um, and have those same attributes, but again, with these new parameters. Um, and when we started slowing down with the Zoom thing, we, you know, a lot of the kids are reaching out saying, hey, when are we going to meet together? Um, we could really sense that the isolation was setting in for a lot of them um, at that point. So we know that that was something that needed to happen and that we needed to really come up with, with something. So one of the first games that we did, um, and remember this is all via Zoom, um, was Jeopardy. We thought that would be a good uh, place to start. And we wanted to make sure that, again, they can do this completely independently, um, all the participants. So we, um, what I have on the screen is uh, one of the PF cards that we made for the Earl Baum Hangout Virtual Jeopardy card, uh, game so that they could have um, the board in their hands and they would know exactly what the categories were, um, how many points they were worth, um, and then I, the, for the next rounds, we were going to put in uh, wiki sticks, with, which um, I believe most of you are familiar with, so that they can mark down which ones have been used and which ones are available. Um, and this was a huge hit. And, and they, I think one game lasted like an hour and 45 minutes, um, just because we were just having so much fun. Um, it was a good game. And, <laughs> yeah, it was a really good game. And we realized that first when the kids got in there, we, they had this great session of like complaining about some of the things that were not accessible that they were getting handed to. Um, and through that, we kind of learned a lot of like where we needed to go. Yeah. Um, I, because I it was so, it was so I, honest. Yeah, it was, it was everything that they were struggling with in school. And I mean, they, you know, they obviously most of them were the only uh, blind or visually impaired individual in their family um, or, you know, and, and a lot of us as, as shelter in place implied, they weren't leaving. So they wouldn't, they didn't have somebody to open up to about that. So once we got them in that zoom call, I mean, it was just, everybody was able to relate with everybody. And, you know, it just seemed like, you know, Neil and I just kind of stood on by and we were able to just observe where, where, what, what we could give them a hand with. Yeah, exactly. And, when I, and what I want to show you now is I have a clip of the game that we played. Uh, I made an audio clip for all the students and I put it to um, just a little graphic. Um, and this is just a one minute clip, but here is um, us playing the uh, EBH virtual Jeopardy. Hopefully you can hear it. In today's thrilling episode of Roll Bomb Hangout Jeopardy, we have two incredible teams going head to head. Will fried chicken come out with the crispy win? Or will Jedi use the force to ensure victory? Let's find out now on Virtual EBH Jeopardy Edition. There's assistive technology, terms, O and M, all things APH, Braille, and name that sound. Braille. All for right, Braille for how Three hundred. Ooh, is everyone ready? Mm, yep. All right. <clears throat> all right, here we go. Braille for three hundred. Real code for encoding mathematical and scientific notation, linearly using standard. What is Nemeth? Oh, oh. <laughs> that was before anyone's hand was raised. <laughs> so I get the point. No, that's fried chicken. That's fried chicken all the way. Good. good. <laughs> <laughs> so it's fried chicken three hundred, Jedi negative two hundred. So that was extremely fun, and they came up with the names. The other team did not have the name by the time we started, and one of the participants was eating fried chicken. So that's how fried chicken became one of the teams. Um, but it was, just, it was just so much fun, and then we realized that with those new parameters, we can still get kind of the same benefits um, through games like that. Um, and immediately we thought of Build a Better Book, um, especially with being able to you know, get the same essentials out of a game um, but using those different parameters. And even teaching-wise, too, uh, me and Eli spent a lot of time um, looking remotely. What could we uh, make accessible and what interactions could we still have with our students um, and still supporting the classroom teacher? We did a lot with Nemeth support. Uh, we did a lot with Zooming in classrooms. Um, and we realized that some of these parameters would actually be so beneficial even um, 
after when, when we were able to get together and do in-person teaching again, um, the fact that you don't always need to be there right next to a student to facilitate that um, is huge, especially for in independence for um, someone who's blind or visually impaired. Yeah. A stable internet connection, I mean, with all the work that we're doing now, uh, you know, the, the, even when we do get past the stage of uh, social distancing and, or, or, um, and all of that, um, you know, it, this work that we're doing now doesn't have to go away. You know, we don't, as Neil said, we don't, we got to the point where if needed be, if, it is, if a student has a Braille note taker, or, you know, we're able to, to drop files um, over the internet um, in Braille format for the student to reference on their Braille note taker. And, you know, it's, it's just, it's not, it's not, it definitely has its place, but it's not a must um, to be right next to the student to be able to, to pump out a hard copy of Braille. Um, you know, so that, that was yeah. a good achievement on that one, I think. Yeah, and even developing some of these systems too. Yeah. Now, if we could do the training for, you know, the in-classroom teachers, they can have direct um, contact with the student. And the, the less that we need to facil facilitate that is greater independence and really the best situation for, for everyone. So the, with those new parameters, um, here's one of the last slides, new parameters, who dis, um, we really saw some benefits and we were talking about this yesterday, um, especially for um, Build a Better Book. Um, me and Eli were trying to remember when we went to the workshop. And I said it felt like 14 years ago because everything's so different. But it was actually a year ago. Um, but what a great design challenge um, to come up with um, accessible materials, accessible games um, with these new kind of remote parameters. Um, and even though we came up with some clever things, so the things that Build a Better Book students are coming up with is incredible. I don't know if you guys follow Ian, um, April, Rachel. Um, they're all doing incredible work with their classes and coming out with things that are not only accessible, but are new. Um, and even, especially, um, we've been doing a lot of work with Ian. He has a whole... Um, course devoted to build a better book where they're coming out with games digital physical that they're sending our group to test out um, to give feedback um, and to make better versions and it's just it's been awesome um, but thinking with these new parameters um, we were talking about this yesterday really this could open up um, a whole new dimension for build a better book because we've all had to um, conform to these new parameters and we've seen some cool things come out of it and build a better book is really ripe for that those parameters to really include um, um, these type of kids and to really make bigger libraries which is completely needed yeah even i mean i, I just saw somebody um put into the chat here that they'd like the, the questions and answers to that Jeopardy game we just showed off. Um, you know, even, even things like that, like, um, you know, just getting a library of resources like this together and sharing information across the board like this, 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 uh, this you know, stuff like this will definitely um, open up a, another world to every, all of us here to you know, do what we wish uh, in terms of, uh, you know, different, different boards, anything like that. Cause when we shot that clip, Neil, didn't we, that was the first uh, run we had at it and nobody, none of us had the boards yet. Um, yeah. And that was the last run video was, you know, we kind of, it kind of clicked and said, like we should get, get all the tactile boards for everybody. Um, and I mean, you got that out within a week, man. That was quick. <laughs> yeah. I think, yeah. I'm surprised that yeah. the mail came that quick. Yeah. So, but that's part of the ideation too. That's so, huge for build a better book too you, oh, you yeah you come up with something and then you you make it you make it better and we yeah. realized that was the one piece that we're missing to make it completely um, independent for our group which is really important because um, that's why they come there to yeah. play games independently yeah. so i th think that's pretty we, we're done a little bit early but i know we wanted to definitely be a little bit more informal and 
have plenty of time to answer any questions. Mm -hmm. So up on the screen, I have uh, my uh, email, my Twitter handle, and Eli's email and Twitter handle. And I will put that in the chat too um, for everyone. Um, and then if there's any questions, um, you can feel free to ask myself or Mr. Eli. Neil McKenzie has stopped screen share. Oh, there's an announcement. <laughs> There we go. Nice. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Concerns, quick. Friday. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take, we'll, we'll take in everything. Neil, I just wanted to echo what you mentioned at the end there because I think it is such an exciting kind of new avenue for, you know, for the first several years of the project, we really have focused primarily on tactile materials using a whole variety of different tools and materials um, with some students starting to also use audio and using Makey Makey or different kind of electronics to complement those physical materials. But I think, um, you know, just thinking about this new situation we're in and thinking about that as its own design constraint is so important. So thinking about what other tools could we engage some of the Build a Better Book participants in that would either help us create more audio-based materials or other kinds of games that can, you know, engage students either in the content they're learning or like you're saying, just in that social piece of giving students an outlet that they now are even missing even more that they're um, not having a chance to go to school. So I'm so glad that you, you guys showed that clip of Jeopardy, but also brought that up as kind of a bigger design challenge of um, thinking about how we might engage the youth we're working in and kind of working on that um, issue and seeing if we can develop additional materials like that. Yeah, yeah cause that was- Yeah, and I think, go ahead, Eli. I was gonna say, uh, I mean, man, the students were so involved once we got the, once the boards, you know, they were able to get their hands on the board, but at the same time, once, you know, you throw in that extra factor of being on Zoom and, a, and a live game. So, I mean, not only are you having a tactile game and I mean, you have the audio aspect to it. I mean, they were just, they were all so involved in it. Um, it was, it was, it was, um, it was really cool watching that all come together. Um, you know, it was, it was definitely an improvement over when we first made the run of just the, just the zoom portion of it. Um, you know, it was, it was just nice watching that come together. So Ting, um, you asked if, Oh, I think, you know, I do have it on the um, SCO website, which I'll put in the chat too. Um, I have that um, board available too, um, and it's public, so anyone can use that. Um, the EBH Jeopardy board, I also have a VI specific one too. Um, and I will put that in the chat. Thanks for reminding me. Um, yeah, it's all ready to go. So let me find that now. Um, I just had a question. I, I've been doing virtual programs and um, at the beginning we really wanted to add, you know, sound and video and all these great things. And I found the more that I added, the more technical problems we had. Um, a lot of, you know, our participants were dropped off or, you know, like they would have to, they got kicked out and they'd have to come back in and it kind of, it just created this situation where it was very asynchronous. Um, did you run into a lot of technical issues on, on their end or on your end? Oh, um, no, because I think we kind of kept it simple with the zoom format. So really when it came down to it, to play Jeopardy, all I needed to do was be able to, um, keep track of the score and know what's left on the board. So by using that, um, site that did that all for me. Mm -hmm. So it was really easy. So it, it, technically once the board was made, that was it. And once we made the tactiles, it didn't really require that much on the technical side, which is also interesting to consider too, now that we have some of these tools available. So they knew how to use Zoom and they had the, the tactile board. So on their end, that was pretty much the, the amount of tech that they needed to, uh, to deal with. Thank you. I was curious since I know with schools, you know, all schools going remote, so many teachers were kind of in this, this rapid period of like 
trying to adopt all kinds of different digital tools, you know, to either get content out to their kids or to have kids submit things or provide reflections or, you know, different, different kinds of digital tools. So was that an issue with some of the students you were working to support in the spring? Like, were they, were they being asked to adopt like other apps or other um, technologies for their classes or, or was it okay? Like on a user <laughs> end, like, like like you mean like new programs that, that were introduced to them yeah like i i think when i just see how teachers are adapting to this remote time i see people like you know people using flipgrid to have students record videos or people using screencastify or you know different tools that um or padlet or you know things that they might not otherwise have used in an in-person setting but they're all trying to kind of figure out like how do we engage our kids at a distance and a lot of them are kind of adopting a whole plethora of different tools. And I just don't have a sense of like how accessible do are most of those tools? Like, are they pretty good? Have you found, or are they so it, challenging? It all depends. Students? That, I think the hardest part was that all of a sudden they were using like three new programs. So we had to go back and be like, okay, we need to, to kind of just relax a little bit, not put so much pressure and learn navigation first check to see if it is accessible because sometimes if it's not accessible there's no point in in trying to get the kids so frustrated on using something that it's it's just broken so first is it you know is it, is it accessible and then if it is then we got to learn the navigation because you're not just jumping into that aspect of it but you like you need to know how to navigate and use it and be comfortable with it if you're really going to add something to that project and then there's this whole other part is like, do you need this whole new program? What's the goal that you're trying to accomplish? Are you just trying to upload something? Are you just trying to organize something? Because some things are just visual, just to be visual. So, you know, how important is it to fight with this thing um, when the goal is just to, you know, just to be comfortable with it? Ex exactly. Um, that's a problem that we, it, that like what Ting mentioned, the importance of using accessible classrooms and making sure those aspects are accessible because if not, you leave a certain population behind. And so that came to the front, especially, like I said, we had a student, all of a sudden they were using three new programs in one week. So that was, um, that was, that was an issue. But it did, like Ting says, it did, put an importance on what's accessible and what's not and why it's so important that we support the programs that are accessible. Because a, a lot of them were accessible, but again, you still need that, that training. You still need to be comfortable navigating that. I am going to go ahead and, and, uh, and share a link right here in the chat to the, um, Oral bomb website here about our uh, our uh, oral bomb hangout just just because it has Neil's cool audio flyer on there for anybody that wants to check it out. Oh, is that the old audio flyer? Yeah, that's the old one. That's the only one they have up on the page. <laughs> yeah, but it's still pretty cool. Does anyone else have any questions for Neil? Or Eli? Or also curious, I know that a few other people here on the call today also work serving students who are blind. And I'm wondering if you have anything you'd like to share about the transition that you made this spring and in, in kind of continuing to support your students during this remote period. Pardon <laughs> I'm also getting that link to that site um, that has the Jeopardy and oh. it has uh, the tactiles on it too. Yeah. So if you want to print those out and does, does everyone know what a pee off machine is? Or is that confusing? I think especially the letter book yeah. words, you know what that is. That's right, yes. There you go. <laughs> So 
Um, Neil, Neil, I had a question for you as far as um, moving forward. I mean, it sounds like you did a lot of groundwork with your students in the spring and summer. Um, how, how do you feel they are going to be as far as going forward or what you're anticipating for the upcoming school year? Do you think that there's anything else that you need, any new technologies or apps that you're looking at to help them with um, whatever the new models for learning are going to be in the fall? Um, so for my, my, uh, my group of, uh, of my age range that I work within, like I said, it's 16 and over. Um, so for me, it's more about, it doesn't seem like as long as the schools don't adopt, um, different softwares and, and programs to do this remote learning, we shouldn't have an issue because a lot of the groundwork and a lot of, uh, the training has already been done on like Google docs and Google drive and Google, uh, classroom, uh, zoom, Dropbox, all that stuff. Um, and I think the biggest, still the biggest hurdle is going to be, um, you know, getting assignments, uh, for the Braille users, uh, getting them from the, uh, professor or, or teacher or what have you, and getting it back to the student, um, before, um, I guess just in the same amount of time as this, as the assignment would get pushed out to anybody else if it was in uh, any other format with whether it be uh, you know paper hard copy or just a regular uh, doc uh, you know things like that um, but I, th I think a lot of the groundwork has already been laid um, for for the the for the training for these programs so as long as they don't change it should be pretty smooth going yeah, the beginning of the year is always, um, I know for us, it's, it's always crazy. And so this is, this is going to be even more uncertainty. So um, we, especially the first few weeks, I know typically I'm usually running around all schools and making sure the setups are working, making sure the bosses are working, making sure the computers are up and running, making sure the systems are going. Um, and a big push is to make sure that we have what they need for that year. Um, meaning that we have the books that meaning we have all the classroom materials. Um, and so we spend a lot of the beginning of the year doing that, but now with all these other added parameters, it's going to look different and we're going to kind of figure out what we need to do. But also this uncertainty is, is coming up to the finish line of like when classes are supposed to start. So it's, it's, there's so much uncertainty, you're not really sure um, what you're preparing for just yet. So you're just really focusing on making sure that they know the basics of what you know is still gonna be there, like their Google Suites, like um, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, is there or will there ever be digital Braille? I'm not sure um, what, can you explain on that? John? Oh, this, yeah. So what I'm thinking is there futuristically, um, cause blind and low vision is not, it's not my area of expertise. <clears throat> like on an iPad, is there ever anything that would ever be developed that the braille, there might be a tactile sensation to like an iPad or some type of tablet that would be there, digitally there, produced? Does that make sense? Than you might think. Yeah. yeah that's, oh, okay. That totally makes sense. Okay. Um, there, there's a lot of people that are extremely close to technology like that, yeah. where you can have like a, a bigger, like a, a tablet size display that could have refresh, like a refreshable uh, Braille display that could not only do images, but can do Braille. And I feel like we are within, I would say a few years, I would say we're that close. What do you think, Eli? Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I mean, we got, we have, um, you know, we have basically the, the, the concepts and the uh, cases are, are formed as just at this point, it's kind of perfecting like, you know, we probably could make it happen as it is now, but it'd be ridiculous expensive and it'd be a huge thing. But I mean, you see, you see progress like the guys in, um, oh, who are those guys, Neil, that are doing the, um, the molecule based uh, braille cells with the electrical impulse things? 
Um, yeah. They're from like uh, Ireland or somewhere like that, right? Somewhere out there. Yeah, there's there's quite a few different approaches people are taking. And there actually has been developed large scale like rail displays that are yeah. kind of clunky, but they're working. So that actually is not a, a bad question. And it, we're not that far off from that. So yeah. the technology is like, I feel like a lot of things were like right there, even the integration, like complete accessibility for this, like the suite accessibility for like Google Classroom and Google Docs. I feel like we're really close mm -hmm. and we're kind of, we're getting right there, which is exciting, but right. also it's a lot, it's a lot to keep up with. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I just had this, you know, this image of like an instant 3D Braille printer on your, on your iPad or something like that. That would, yeah. Yeah. So what did and, you and, do with your, oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, I, I, th there's this thing called the graffiti from APH and it's kind of like a, it's, it's a pretty decent size um, display and it hooks into the, um, the, uh, uh, what card is it on a computer, the video card. Yeah, the video. And um, it would, uh, it would come up with the grayscale and you would get instant, uh, feedback on what's on the screen. So we actually tried it with um, open SCAD and we were able to see basic shapes that we we're making um, in real time, which is like really cool. I mean, we're getting close with all this stuff and it's pretty exciting. That's really cool. What did you do with your 3D printer? How did you oh, use um, that? Like, oh, I um, make a lot of models for my students. Um, I use it a lot for science and math and um, tools that specifically help them um, with their AT stuff, whether it be games to learn Braille or um, so, different devices for math. Yeah. Yeah. I, was I love that thing. Yeah. Excellent. Thank like, you. What's the difference? Like, um, like how, how, what are the differences between like the PF and the embosser? Like they're, they sim oh, they're okay. similar, correct? Well, they both create tactile materials. Um, right. The, embosser uses a set of like hammers and okay. that's more of the traditional braille that you would like feel in books okay. um and I, so i'll use the embosser for like uh large assignments or or big reading books um and i'll use the piaf for more finite diagrams okay um because the the piaf is is like what i do is just you know make like you saw some of those um, pdfs i made and then so i can be a lot more specific because it raises all the black ink Yep. Um, so knowing those parameters, I know that I can get pretty right. finite yeah. diagrams. Fine. But okay. the embosser I use probably a lot more okay. so, yeah. for braille assignments and yeah, stuff like that. Ting. Oh hey, uh, this is Ting. Hey Ting. I coordinate the teacher um, teaching program at SF State and visual impairments, and so. Um, John, your question about digital Braille, I, I know, I think, were you specifically asking about Braille on a, t on a screen, such as like on an iPad? Yes. Uh-huh. Um, so there are a couple um, kind of beta tools that have been developed, but my biggest um, kind of reminder of people interested in technology in this area would be that um, the biggest constraint is that right now when you have anything, any type of interaction on a screen interface, um, you're limited to a single touch. So like iPad screens can't handle multiple input touch, like multi-finger touch. And so a lot of the applications that I've seen developed for iOS, the problem is that it only allows for single point touch, which means you could put the pad of your finger on one single braille cell or dot, but like if you try to, you know, use haptic technology to render like an image or a bunch of braille, especially for, t um, for tactile images. Um, it's best practice for, for, for students to have multiple hands and fingers to explore the graphic. Um, it is not recommended whatsoever to have, to have a student explore a tactile graphic ever with just one single finger. And so right now the screen-based interfaces with the haptic technology only allows for single finger interaction. And so that's the big problem with it. And I don't, I don't know how many of you guys are affiliated with, like, you know, the, the, the CU Boulder program, and um, I, I've worked with their um, HCI departments a little bit, and I think I see some familiar names here, um, but I just wanted to caution people that until the screens can really take multiple finger input, like, it's not going to be a viable technology for tactile graphic interaction. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Thank you. Huh. 
haptic was the word I was looking for, right? <laughs> Too. Yeah. Thank you, Ting. Awesome. All right, Neil, it looks like there, and Eli, there's a good question in the chat asking about good guidelines for determining accessibility of a virtual program. Yeah, yeah I have some great resources. Um, maybe I can put some of these things together and then we can send out an email. Um, yeah, that would be great. We could also put some... on our website as well. Yeah, and actually okay, we'll perfect. put them in the video description once it's ready to go up on the website too. So yeah, just send me all your links and your and your PowerPoint presentation. Anything you want to link to, I can put them in. Yeah, it's awesome. A lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a really. But that's point. a great question. Yeah, that's a great one. Are there any you want to highlight now, just as we um, wrap up? In a nutshell, um, oh boy, Neil. I mean, I, I mean, so I, I primarily work with um, with uh, blind and low vision. So I mean, the first thing for me when when I get a consultant job, consulting job would be, um, maybe you know, our our buttons on uh, on the virtual area labeled. Um, you know, because a lot of times you can actually just put graphics on the buttons when they're put together, uh, when they're coded. Um, so when you're making a website or a blog or something like that, you can, you know, the text is more like graphics. So when your screen reader goes over that, it'll just say button, 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 button. You know, it won't, it won't give you anything like a share button or a print button or anything. It just says button and you don't know what it is. Um, and also there's some issues with that at, some, at times when you use things with like um, Supernova or Zoom Text or Windows Magnifier um, because those images can get kind of blurry. Um, I'm not sure why that happens, but when you try to enlarge them for, for somebody to uh, look at them on a larger uh, scale, they do get, they can get kind of distorted. Um, so, you know, Man, there's I would say too, like, it's especially if you're, you know, making basic materials to make sure you have headings labeled for yep. easy navigation and make sure if you do add something that's visual, like a picture or something to make sure you have that description there too. So yeah. that someone can get the same benefit yeah. um, if they're blind or uh, visually impaired. Um, and because de depending on even how you output certain um, um, documents, could be the difference between it coming up just as an image. So if someone was, you know, had a screen reader, they would just get image mm -hmm. or they can get everything um, yeah. depending on, on how you um, export it and making sure it's, it's true digital and um, headings and um, definitely put some uh, descriptions into those pictures. Or mm -hmm. well, if we have any like professor, also, when I was going through, when I was going through college system, um, and we would have, you know, the hybrid classes where you go in uh, once a week and then the rest of the time you're online. Uh, a lot of professors would take their hard copy materials and scan them in and send us out the JPEGs of those scanned images. Um, you know, so things like that. Yeah, it's digital and it comes out and you can see it on your screen real nice. But for a screen reader, you get nothing but it says JPG. That's it. Um, you know, so I would, you know, you have to run those through an OCR program or, or some other type of way of getting it. Um, and sometimes the JPGs, they just, they, they, they get, they can get a little blurry in some spots. So, you know, um, I guess, you know, maybe try to, um, uh, you know, export more like as actual PDFs or, or DOCs or, stuff like that instead of instead of like a you know jpgs or uh, mpegs and stuff like that awesome and ting just saved us here she has um a link to um a dropbox that has accessibility tips oh there you um, go that she's been building over years hey <laughs> that's awesome thank you ting yeah we're so glad ting's local and around oh, yeah. here she's oh, yeah. She's amazing. Does that, does anyone else have any other questions? Looks like that might be it. Minutes. 
<laughs> Two minutes early. Well, thank you so much, Neil and Eli, for joining us and sharing kind of your stories from the past few months about some of the tips for supporting your students. So, yeah, we're we're happy to be asked to come back, and we're we we've, we've gained so much from Build a Better Book, and the collaboration is awesome. So, oh, yeah. we we really love it. Well, and I I would say. To um, other Build a Better Book sites that are looking for an interesting design challenge for your participants, especially if you're going to be working with your students in a virtual setting this fall, thinking about um, some of what Neil and Eli talked about today and maybe thinking about how your students might come up with some games that they could potentially try out at their hangout with teens. I bet uh, yeah. Neil and Eli, you guys are usually willing testers and provide a lot of helpful feedback. So. Yeah, and some of the best games that have come out of this are from the students. Oh, they, their creativity is yeah. is amazing. So yeah, and I I love seeing um, some familiar names here: Janet and Steven and Max. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't see the meeting invite until like. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we'll have Max well, we think... on next week. <laughs> Max is. I know. We'll be there for that one. Three yeah. doodler, and next week on August sixth, we'll be talking about three D giving day, and three D three D pen use. So hopefully, if you, Max, you can join us next week as well for that. Awesome. <laughs> yes, I, I will. I just apologize that I showed up right at the end. <laughs> well, at least we got at least we got to say hi. <laughs> All right, guys, thank you so All much. Right, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Take care. See you next Thanks, time. Guys.